So I'm going to give a nice rambling, probably disoriented, but very opinionated talk on uh, emulators. The reason I'm going to talk about emulators is that emulators have kind of been a common theme of my life for the last 10 years. I never really intended to make emulators a focus of my research, at least not at first. It just sort of creaked in there. Just like I went to school for electrical engineering and somehow I drifted over to computers even though I tried to avoid them for so long. They just permeated just a calling. I knew I had to do emulators eventually. So what I'm going to do is I will get I will talk a little bit about emulators, what they are, which I imagine many of you probably have an idea. I'll talk about some of the wonderful emulators I created. Um, that's stated both truly and ironically. And finally, I'll talk about what you need to do if you want to make an emulator. This is probably something that is on many of your minds because um, Nathaniel is trying to make an emulator, Will is trying to use my emulator, Cam is trying to make my emulator look prettier, and um, I don't know, the other three of you, have you ever done an emulator before? <laughs> so, if you want to do Playing some games. Sony PlayStation emulator. Sony PlayStation emulator. Have you actually built one? No, no. but... <laughs> I was going to say, that's a, that would be impressive. <laughs> Alright, so, first of all, this is mainly for that audience in Sweden, um, but let's just say, what is an emulator? Well, an emulator is basically a program that pretends to be a machine. It will hopefully mimic all parts of the machine, but it doesn't have to. What it really needs to do in the end is fool the software that's running on it, that it is actually running on the real machine and not your program trying to pretend to be a machine. That so uh, can be really simple, but in reality, the programs tend to figure out eventually that you are just mimicking a machine and they will crash or perform strange things in various period ways. But with a bit of effort we can uh, delay that inevitable point of reckoning for as long as possible and um, we can actually do some pretty cool things. Okay, so a program pretending to be a piece of hardware, why in the world would you write it? Um, I generally found that there, these are just, these are probably not an exclusive list, but there are, are a whole bunch of applications for these. I'm really going to focus on a few of them because those are the applications I've been interested in. You probably uh, have already, if you've worked with Android, have already played with an emulator because you've used the Android development environment or the one for the iPhone if you've played with that. That's essential because the alternative is every time you write a piece of software, you have to upload it to the phone and see if it works. You may not have a phone, or you may have a lot of weird Apple policies preventing you from uploading it to the phone. <laughs> so development is kind of a key point. But that's not the one that interests me right now, so I'm going to ignore it. This one is probably where you, uh, where you all come in. The <coughs> emulating so that you can play with archaic systems or unavailable systems which may mean emulators for the ENIAC or an obscure Turing or an abstract Turing machine, but what it really means is gaming. Basically, making an emulator of your Game Boy or your Super Nintendo so that you don't have to actually go out and buy the system or install the system and you can play all the different games. Sandboxing is a key one. Basically, writing an emulator pretty much of the machine that you are running the emulator on sounds a little recursive, but it's good because it prevents software that you're running on the emulator from messing with your machine. Maybe. Computer architecture research this is probably the one which guys in the room are the least familiar with. But if you want to design a novel microprocessor, and you want to actually put it into production, and you really have a neat idea that would make a microprocessor work twice as fast, and you just want to see if that idea will work, well, you could, if you wanted to, create the full layout of your idea 
send it over to a fabrication facility, pay them a few hundred thousand dollars, wait a few months, and then you'll get it back and you'll see if you got it right or wrong. Or you can build a software that mimics the system and try it out on the software first before you send it to uh, development. So pretty much all computer architecture research, apart from that done at major universities that have a fabrication facility on, step, on hand, um, are, and even at those, are done via emulation. And finally, my personal favorite, there's really no way properly to teach computer design or computer organization without using an emulator. Because how else are you going to actually be able to look at what's going on in memory, what's going on in the registers while programs are running? You can't really do it on your computer. Um, you need a very good magnetic field magnifying glass or something. Um, but if you have an emulator, you might have a nice display that shows you what's contained in the registers. So, archaic systems, computer architecture research, and teaching computer design are the ones I'm going to come back to. All right, maybe in a little more depth, um, gaming is probably one that, all right, how many of you have used a gaming emulator? Right. <laughs> how, many of those game, how many of you have used a gaming emulator on this list? Oh, yeah. Basically, this is one of the key places where people make realistic emulators of full, of full systems. And we have, these are a list of some of my favorites. DOSBox works really, really nicely for playing those old DOS games and even some early window games. And it's probably one of the fastest x86 emulators I know of out there for uh, what it does. They've all even got it working fairly well on an Android phone um, running well, faster than the DOS machines. Um, some other ones, Virtual Boy, PSX. This one, this PlayStation emulator works actually very nicely on an Android phone. Java PC, which I am very familiar with. It's an attempt to create a PC in Java, which by interesting coincidence is an attempt that I've also made. And Super Nintendo emulator, this is in C++. Most of these are actually C++, because if you want speed, you really can't go for other languages. That's what we're going to find out. Totally different world than the uh, teaching emulator, or the gaming emulator is the teaching emulator. What you see before you is kind of a screenshot of the old classic SPIM. SPIM is probably one of the first real teaching simulators out there. It's trying to mimic a um, MIPS architecture, which is an architecture that actually you probably use in the form of televisions or even microwaves, but you probably have uh, never actually really played with the architecture of the CPU. However, MIPS is kind of a good example of a really, really simple architecture, and so it's kind of a long time favorite for teaching computer organization courses. And so a guy named uh, Jim Morris at uh, University of Wisconsin, um, he's done other great computer architecture work, but I think SPIN is the one that he's going to be remembered for. He just wrote this. It is insanely simple. It has one window showing what the registers are, one window showing what the machine code is, one window showing what's in memory, and one window showing copyright information. I have no idea why, but they, <laughs> they sign up with a character for that. And then if you run it, you get a nice little pop-up window of a console. But he didn't really go into I.O. or anything like that. It's just a total text-based console. And that's generally a theme with almost all of these, um, except for the last one, is that they just, um, computer architecture courses, for whatever reason, seem to like to begin and end with the processor. Nothing else is really interesting except maybe memory. And so all of these are focused on just teaching the processor. Box is kind of the weird exception, but students are not really expected to look inside a box and see how it works. I wouldn't recommend it from experience. All right. Screenshot on the left is what I think a computer architecture simulator ought to look like. The screenshot on the right is what they really look like. Um, 
the computer architecture simulators are, they won't have any console. They will be entirely um, text-based, and all they're basically trying to do is mimic an actual system as exactly as possible. That could mean actually trying to handle the data paths between various registers in the CPU. It could be trying to mimic the pipelining that goes on, all the various intricacies of the processor. And what you're really looking for is what you get at the end, which is all of the statistics about your program. How many cache misses do you, do you have? That will tell you whether your cache was good. How many instructions per cycle? That will tell you whether your processor design was good. Um, how much memory did it end up using up? How many system calls did it make? These are the sorts of things that the people were interested in. All right. So I guess before going into my own, I should ask the question, why should I? Why should you make one? I said I, but I mean you all. Um, why should you all sit down and make an emulator? Well, the reason that has always seemed to go for me is the first one. Um, the existing emulators are crap, uh, for lack of a better word. This is pretty much true in whatever field you have because um, people making an emulator is hard work and people like to take shortcuts and give up early and so on. And you'll end up 